So today we're going to tell a story about how we use data and analytics to answer really important questions that were on the minds of our community. In addition to that, we're going to talk about how lessons from other analytical fields were brought into the people analytics field to give us insights that we probably wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Let's take a look now. Thank you. Um, so before I get into that, uh, Shuba, who will be talking after me, she's the example. She's a computational biologist by training, so her expertise and experience in this case was a super helpful tool to uncover insights that we wouldn't have otherwise come to in this, this analysis. I want to talk just a bit uh, so with a little bit of framing about the Broad, because the context does matter. So the Broad is truly an amazing place. We are a research, a nonprofit research institute that's really trying to empower a revolution in biomedicine. It was founded in 2004 through the visionary leadership of Eric Lander, who saw an opportunity after the Human Genome Project to think about science being done in a new way. In particular, the challenges of the 21st century scientifically weren't going to be able to be tackled in an individual lab with an individual PI, but it was going to take a more collaborative approach. So the Broad was started as an experiment to see if this collaborative approach could work. And the collaborative approach is about crossing boundaries of all kinds. So the Broad is a combination, or, or I'm sorry, a partnership between Harvard, MIT, and all the Harvard Medical Teaching Hospitals in Boston. And it brings together almost 5,000 people who are scientists, physicians, software engineers, coming across disciplines in service of the mission of the Broad. Just a few examples of what we do, because one of the common misconceptions is that the Broad is this academic institution you know, doing academic work. So here are just a few small examples of the work we're doing. So uh, one example is therapeutics development. So we are working with some of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world to develop drugs. We have a data science platform, which is focusing on um, you know, making data available to the world. And there's almost 200 software engineers. And since we're at a data conference, the genomics platform, I thought I would bring this in, that's the gen genomic services you see there. Uh, we are the largest genomic sequencing center in the world. So the amount of data we have is 100 petabytes of data that we're managing. So to put that into lay terms, that's about the equivalent of 1,000 iTunes. So think of all the content on iTunes, there, there's, and multiply that 1,000. That's the level of data that we're managing. 30 terabytes per day is what we're producing, and that's doubling almost every eight months. So we're, we're pushing the boundaries of scalability in ways that had never been done before. So I joined the Broad in 2014. I don't think this is going to work. I can't move. Uh, in 2014, and while I have the same role, um, the job has changed you know, quite a bit. The world around us is changing, and I do think that's an amazing thing, and it's a good thing, and it should happen. Some of these topics that are happening and being discussed in the world have long been ignored by society or haven't been paid as much attention to as they should. Now people are talking, they're engaging, they're wanting change to happen. And the momentum that is built because people can connect more quickly and can connect um, you know, in ways in which they could never have before, things are amplifying very quickly. And what's happening, I think, is that what people expect from their organization is rapidly changing as well. So no longer is it okay to say, well, there's things happening in the world that we don't have to worry about at work. These things are all intertwined. So for example, I think that organizations now have to take a stand. What do you believe in? People expect that. They expect you to say it clearly and, to, and, be, and be vocal about that. There is an increased demand for transparency. Gone are the days where we could say, trust us, everything's okay. People are demanding to understand how decisions were made and where the data came from. And finally, it's not enough just to simply promise that things will change. People expect action. They aren't going to be satisfied with promises of future action. So one of the topics that are important in our community is uh, uh, women in science. Historically, women have not received the same level of support or opportunities, and oftentimes pay as their male counterparts. So as you can imagine, this is a question that's really important to our community, uh, and one that people are interested in learning more about. And while progress has been made, no one is satisfied, and we needed to do more. So just to give you a flavoring of the types of questions that I would get asked in my day to day are things like, are we paying men and women fairly or equally? Are women being promoted? at the same rate as their male counterparts. So there's any number of questions here. And this is where the intersection of data and uh, you know, analytics and HR, I think, is critical. So while we all feel 
like we're doing these things, we didn't have the data to really answer those questions in a concrete way. So that's where Shuba comes in. So we said, we need to tackle this in a data-driven way such that we can have these important uh, conversations. So we started with pay equity, and it was what you'll see you know, very quickly is questions of pay equity turn out to be the easy part. And there's a lot more that we had to tackle and uncover uh, along the way. So I'll turn it over to Shuba. Okay, so let's talk about pay equity for a moment. So the principle is a very simple one, right? It's equal pay for comparable work. And yet when we look across the US, the gap between the average male salary and the average female salary is 18%, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And there's quite a bit of variation state to state. There are states where that gap is larger and states where that gap is smaller. It's also clear we're not gonna legislate our way out of this gap because 42 states have equal pay laws on the books and yet this gap is still there. And some of you may have noticed that this past Tuesday was equal pay day, which is the number of day, additional days a woman has to work to make as much as a man did last year. So that's a pretty dire state of affairs. And it's true that this gap persists no matter what slice of the US population we look at. The National Science Foundation reports salaries for the scientific workforce, and again, the average male salary is 22% larger than the average female salary. And in fact, when we looked at the Broad Institute, our gap was 11%. So there's clearly an issue here. And the question organizations need to ask is, what do we want to achieve in trying to close this gap? So I need to step back for a moment and explain to you this gap that I'm describing. It's what wage economists refer to as the unadjusted pay gap. Very simple metric. It's just the median of all the female salaries in your organization divided by the median of all the male salaries in your organization. Really simple to compute, easy to understand. Here's the challenge with this metric. Remember that our principle is equal pay for comparable work. There is nothing in this simple ratio that accounts for comparable work. And we know that there are meaningful differences in pay, unique skill sets, prior experience. None of that is captured in this very simple metric. So this metric puts all the emphasis on equal pay and doesn't consider comparable work at all. So I wanna encourage you to think of this as the easy metric, it is not the right metric. There is a better metric. It's called the adjusted pay gap. With this metric, you can take into account meaningful differentiators in pay. You can also compare types of work in an appropriate way. This captures the full breadth of the principle we're pursuing. You do this through linear regression. I'm not gonna go into the details here. I'm happy to talk about that offline. But essentially, after you've accounted for all the meaningful differentiators for pay in your organization, anything that's remaining is attributed to gender. And I wanna just mention here, we do talk about gender in a very binary way uh, because typically that's the data we have, but there's obviously a non-binary experience. We just can't capture it in our data. So, if you do such an adjusted pay gap analysis across the US, the estimates range from 5.4% to 8.4%. That's still big, but it's nowhere near that 18 to 22% I just showed you. So we did the same at Broad, and I just mentioned the unadjusted pay gap is 11%. I would love it if all of you stopped thinking about that metric altogether. Instead, what I'd like you to do is focus on the adjusted pay gap. So we did that taking into account job function, job level, experience and time and role. And our adjusted pay gap at the Broad Institute is negative 0.45%, very close to zero. The negative sign actually indicates a slightly gap in favor of women, but it's not statistically significant. So if you're me and you're sitting in the audience and you're thinking, fantastic, she did the math, we're done with this talk, that's actually not what happens because if you're like Andy, you're thinking, Okay, so what, <laughs> right? Analysis is only interesting if it delivers an insight. And it turns out you can't really understand pay equity without understanding representation. So I'm gonna walk you through an example of how representation intersects with pay equity, even in an adjusted pay gap analysis. Let's take an example. Let's imagine an organization that is just software engineers. And um, we're all familiar in the popular press with the lack of women software engineers. There's an underrepresentation of women in this field. So in our imaginary organization here, let's say we have five ranks of software engineers ranging from entry level on the left-hand side of this chart through the senior most level on the right-hand side of the chart. Now ideally what you would wanna do is adjusted pay gap analysis comparing each rank to itself. 
the males and females in each rank. The challenge is you don't have enough individuals in any given rank to be able to do this in a statistically robust way. So instead, let's say we're going to aggregate them. Perhaps we do two levels out of those five ranks. So this is great. Now we have enough people in each category that we can do the analysis. But we have magnified the representation gap, especially in that right-hand category, where now we have three females and 43 males, 10 of whom make substantially more, just because they're the most senior individuals in the organization. And if we were to run this sort of analysis, we would get a gender pay gap of roughly 3% and a p-value of about 0.09. So it's not statistically significant, but there's a gap. You would want to look into this as an organization. So the challenge of small numbers, small population sizes, this bedevils a lot of people analytics works in, in organizations. It is not a new problem. It exists in other fields, too. So as Andy mentioned, I'm a computational biologist by training. And in biomedical science, we run into this all the time. So for example, at the Broad Institute, one of our areas of focus are rare diseases. So by definition, you can't have a lot of individuals with the disease. It's rare. Um, but you do want to understand the genetic variants of that disease so you can understand what treatment would actually make a difference, what therapies would be appropriate. So you have to work with small data sets. And computational biology has come up with some solutions, one of which is permutation testing. And I'll walk you through how that works in a moment. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to compute the effect of representation on the pay gap. Here's how it works. Let's say now that we're an organization of exactly eight individuals, two females and six males. And what we're going to do is we permute each individual in this role is we're going to keep that proportion of male to female constant. So for example, we do a permutation this way. We randomly reassign the gender labels, keeping all the other data constant, and we're keeping that proportion the same. And we do it again and again and again and again, thousands of times, typically 10,000 times, until you get this nice bell curve. And now what this bell curve shows you is the range of pay gaps possible based on the representation gap in your organization. So in our example here, we started with a, a gender pay gap of 3%. Now we're going to subtract out the average representation effect from our permuted distribution. So we subtract out 1.6%. And we're left with 1.4%, which is the adjusted gender pay gap. This is the real pay gap in this little example. And you derive a p-value from the distribution, so that's 0.5. So we did this analysis. We wrote a, a summary report. And of course, we discovered what everyone in the room probably knows, which is math is never enough. I learned a lot about math. Math is never enough. <laughs> um, so one of the, I think, most important parts of what we did is then we released this report to our community. Before we did the full uh, sharing, we did um, share it with a few folks just to get some feedback. So the initial reaction was, this can't possibly be right. And this is with respect to the pay gap. So our response was, as Shuba described, the unadjusted versus adjusted, that helped. The next question was, especially in our community, sh show me more data. I want to understand the math that you did. So we had a really important, I think, transparency question to wrestle with at this point, which is how much data to share. So we decided to actually share most of the data, the detailed data tables, of course, keeping people's individual information private, but enough information such that the computational geeks in our community would look at this and say, OK, they did, it, they did this in a, in a robust way. Then, of course, that gets us to the most important question, which is, what are you going to do with this? So this began an important six months at the Broad, where we engaged the community through multiple forums. Hundreds of people participated in both individual discussions and in group discussions and you know, online forums giving feedback, asking questions, giving suggestions on future analysis. You can just imagine in our community all sorts of analyses were proposed, and we'll you know, do those maybe the next time. What came out of those discussions were, I think, three really important things that we decided to focus our, our work on institutionally. Increasing the number of exceptional female applicants in computational fields, supporting, increasing the support for career development and advancement, and strengthening support for harassment prevention. Now, you might say that, well, couldn't you have written those down without doing this report? And the reality is we probably could. But to me, this is the most important part of this analysis. We could not have gotten to these, these three and have them be accepted by the community had we not addressed the underlying questions around everything else. And we needed a strong data foundation to do that. Now, we have an organization that says, OK, thank you for sharing that data. Now, we can focus on the things that are actually important, because many of the other topics we've addressed you know, for the moment in some other way. 
Finally, in terms of takeaways, I, data grounds the conversation. The whole foundation, you can't do any of these conversations without having really robust data. The dialogue is critically important to highlight uh, individual lived experiences. And I will point out here that we are about to embark on another report, which is for the underrepresented, underrepresented minorities in our community. And in this case, we're gonna do something slightly different. We're gonna incorporate the lived experiences into this initial report and gather some data and uh, qualitative data uh, you know, as part of this process. And finally, the principles really drive your actions. If you believe in transparency and you believe in taking a stand, these are the types of choices that you make. So thank you.